So I would like first to welcome all to, um, to this um, practitioner seminar series. So for today, um, I have the pleasure to introduce you Irma Perez. Irma Perez, uh, she's, um, she has over 17 years of professional experience, including different positions in the United Nations, the private sector and international organizations. And currently, she works as a research assistant in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs in United Nations headquarters, with a focus in the participation of the civil society in the Economic and Social Council. Um, Irma is also visiting academic at eBay uh, right now. Um, in 2019, she was selected to join on a temporary assignment in the transition team of the Executive Office of the Secretary General, assisting in all aspects um, of the repositioning of the UN development system in light of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable um, Development. Um, Irma holds a Master in International Relations with a specialization in international political economy from eBay a Certificate of Global Affairs from the New York University and a Bachelor's Degree in Economics, summa cum laude, from the University of the Valley of Mexico. Um, Irma and I, we were um, classmates many years ago here at eBay when we did the master, and for me, it's, it's a great pleasure uh, to, to, well, to have you here, and, and thank you so much for um, accepting our invitation today. So, um, as I mentioned um, to you um, before, I would like um, this session to be more a, of a conversation rather than a more traditional um, presentation. And one of the things that I am particularly curious about is about your trajectory with the UN. What has this trajectory been? Which positions have you occupied over time? Thank you so much, Juan Carlos, and good afternoon, good evening in Barcelona. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invite. It's, it's very nice to be in the eBay now from another perspective, from another side. So I joined the UN in 2010 as an intern. Uh, back in the days, well, I don't know now in the eBay, but we used to, we have to earn credits doing uh, some sort of social service or working on an NGO or somewhere. And I applied in the UN just, um, it was a second time, the first time I was not selected. And as you know, there is this uh, deadline that you have to be a current student. So luckily I was selected on the second, on the second um, chance that I had. And I was there for two months. It was an unpaid uh, internship that later I extended up to six months and like on the last month that I was there I was um, I was invited to to participate in a temporary assignment as a team assistant so since then I've been working in different positions team assistant um, information technology assistant at some point a staff assistant research assistant so that, that has been the positions that I have held that, yeah, that's that's wonderful. And I wanted uh, to ask you, Irma, um, I mean, you know, like our students, they are very much interested in the world of international organizations. Actually, uh, for, for many of us, this is one of the main motivations um, to do um, this master. So I wanted to ask you, I mean, what were what was um, your motivation? Um, to apply to the UN? I mean, how was the, the whole process? Could you tell us a little bit more about, about this experience? Sure. So when I wanted to get my the certificate of the master's, I applied to the UN just because I wanted to get experience from, you know, like an international um, organization. And I applied based and on the fact that I know that it was unpaid. So that was a big burden from my side, but I knew that I wanted to have that experience. And I was even telling to myself, I can get even get a loan if I am selected. Like you start like putting in the balance all the things that you that you can get from that experience that you can get benefit from. And that was the reason, like uh, I never thought about um, getting a position there. To me, that was completely unreachable at that point. 
And once that you are in the system as an intern, then you get to know new people, new things about the UN, the good and bad, all these type of comments. Oh, you should apply the, here, you shouldn't apply that. And I had also a lot of, of classmates and colleagues at that time that also started looking into other paths like consultancies, temporary appointments in NGOs and in, in UN agencies as well. So everybody tried to get a, a channel how to get into the system, even though we knew that we had to apply officially through the Young Professionals Program that maybe you already heard about it. But there, there are other ways to also get in into the system. So that was my main my main motivation, well, first to get the credits, to get my certificate for the eBay, but later to acquire this professional experience in probably the biggest international organization in the world. And, and before applying to, to the UN, Irma, how familiar w were you with the UN system? I mean, how much uh, you knew? I mean, because I guess that, I mean, it was quite a change uh, to arrive there without knowing much about, I mean, the, the headquarters. So could you tell us a bit more what was, I mean, yeah, how familiar were you with, with, with the whole uh, UNC? Yeah, to be honest, I was not that familiar because my background was in economics. So I was more into banks and central banks, all these type of monetary policy issues. But when I was in the masters, I, I got like more and more familiar almost like every day because of the papers that we have to prepare and to write at that time, but also, listening all of my classmates also in the eBay, I remember quite a few that they were talking about the, like different activities that they have uh, work on in the UN, they knew the names of the SGs by heart, like it was like, okay, apparently this is, this is like a big thing, I should get more and more familiar. And then I remember also we have very good professors that they also give me that knowledge and that that insight like okay maybe it would be nice to work over there and i think it's also in the basic basic literature in international relations so basically i mean the i mean the, the, the experience that you had was more from i mean i mean, I mean was more theoretical more based from what you have learned uh, from the master than actually um, knowing by heart what what was was it like Right. Absolutely, yes. And now that you are uh, mentioning about well, your your work um, at, at the UN, could you tell us a little bit a little bit more about your current position? What do you do? Uh, I mean, what are your duties? Um, yes. Certainly. So right now I am a research assistant in the Department of Economic Affairs. I, one, my work is divided into main tasks. One of them is the substantive part, which is uh, to be in commun constant communication with NGOs. That means a civil society who wants to pursue consultative status to be officially recognized by the UN. They have to apply through the Economic and Social Council, which is the main official body to, to get that accreditation. And I am in charge of basically reviewing those applications from the NGOs. Uh, that being said, when the applications are incomplete or we have to communicate something with them, we just do that uh, through different, different channels. And later, once that applications are completed, then we submit it to the NGO committee, which is composed by 19 member states uh, distributed by geographical area. And we just follow the procedures right now with all the things that happen after the pandemic the methods of work had to change also and that is also important mm -hmm. to say it because there were things that we were just doing like for the last 40 minutes that the, the ECOSOC existed that now those, those procedures had to change. Mm -hmm. That's one, that's my main task and the other part is more to help on the on the administrative part of my of my branch, we call them branches, so I am the focal point of of all these administrative um, human resources issues and stuff. So it's also important because in that regard, even though people don't think of the UN as a, a administrative body at the end of the day is bureaucratic itself. So we have mm -hmm. to also deal with a lot of, of processes to, to get people on board, to get, uh, to get equipment, to get software and things like that. So in that I'm also responsible of. And now that you are uh, mentioning uh, about this task that that you were uh, that you well, that you currently do, um, I'm curious to learn about I don't know any project or or projects you are particularly proud of, 
uh, that you could share with, with, with us that, that you can think of? Sure. Um, I've been selected in two temporary promotions and in one of them I remember that I had to, to assist in the outreach to NGOs. So even when we are getting applications of NGOs, that doesn't mean that our work is completely known to the whole civil society. So we have to reach out to NGOs and that was very interesting because it was a completely another area that I didn't know, which is communications and global outreach, also to use different platforms. So that was also, it was a challenge for me, but also at the same time, I learned a lot because it was like, okay, now you have to go and expand your knowledge into other into other areas like software. How do you send massive uh, communication to, email, to NGOs? How do you engage with all of their counterparts that also might, might benefit of this, of this outreach? Uh, when I was in the USG, that was, there were, that was because we were working in the development reform. Almost every day was a new challenge, but one of them was uh, when I was when I was assigned to work in um, organizing a plenary se session of the Under Secretary General, Mrs. Amina Mohammed. And that was that was definitely a challenge. It was something that I had no clue how to do, it, and it was everything from scratch, and it had to be done. So it was also to improve and fine tune some skills that maybe I had, but at that point I really needed, which was communication with other offices, constant communication to be flexible and also at the same time to be straightforward with the demands that we had based on the type of meeting that we had to organize. So those are the, yeah, two projects that I can think of right now. Great. And now that, that you were mentioning about um, these challenges, I mean, one, um, and I remember this from our previous conversations, one important job uh, that you do is precisely to be a liaison with, with NGOs. With, I, and could you tell us a bit more what is the profile of these NGOs? How, I mean, what type of relationship do you have with them? Basically, what, I mean, do they... I mean, devote their work to claims making and you channel those claims to the General Assembly. Could you tell us a bit more about, about this part? Yes. So basically, the, when we receive the applications, because we have to improve our, our processes somehow, everything now is through platforms. We don't communicate with them over the phone anymore. So that helps us a lot because there is a standard application form that they have to submit. Uh, indicating which are the objectives that they have and what will be their contribution to ECOSOC. I will say that that's the main question of the application form. Mm -hmm. But also they have to submit some supporting documents. And that's also when we get into the tricky part of the, of the review, because sometimes you see NGOs that might have certificate of registrations issued by non necessarily governmental authorities. Or mm -hmm. just to put an example, they are based in in Jammu and Kashmir, but their certificate that they have is from another entity that is not really recognized by the UN. So th that's when we get into the, I would say, the juicy part of this review, because <laughs> when we already submitted to the to the committee, sometimes the missions, the member states, they get back to us saying, this NGO, you say that it has the certificate, however, is fake, however, is outdated however, is not a governmental entity. So that's when we have to start like talking to the NGOs, going back. And it's a very interesting process because also when the committee is taking place, the NGOs are also allowed to participate. If there are questions, they can come over and reply like in, in person to the, to the committee. It's a fascinating process that for the last two years has been uh, transmitted online, is broadcasted. So it's also mm -hmm. an open area for the civil society to see how the exchange can be. And mm -hmm. on, in that regard, um, yes, we have a lot of applications that are currently on hold. I will say, well, the, the official award is deferred because there are always questions from certain countries um, yeah, asking about things that they they find important before uh, giving the accreditation to these NGOs. It might be about the finances. It might be about uh, claims that are terrorist organizations that, that they are governmental indeed, that they are uh, IGOs, not necessarily NGOs. So all these type of questions that definitely need to to be to be addressed by the organization directly. Mm -hmm. 
And, and if I may, what happens uh, for, I mean, when you receive applications from NGOs coming from countries with a difficult political situation, I mean, that might, might be, I mean, in opposition to the, to the national governments, I mean, how do you manage these kind of situations? One of our tasks is just to, is to ensure that they are aligned to the UN Charter. So, for instance, when we see in the application that they are talking about separatism in some territories, that's the first like red flag for us. Like we have to contact the NGO and just to inquire a little bit further. However, there are other questions that might be posed by the member states directly when we are already during the committee that they have to address. And if they don't, or if some certain member states they see as a threat to the UN, they have the, the right to ask to close this application. And on that, mm -hmm. at that moment, that's when, because they are 19, they have to go on a voting process and then just to see what might happen. If the member state is asking, we need to close this application, it, it might happen and we have a lot of these type of cases, then that application goes to the Economic and Social Council, which uh, takes place in Geneva, and they are the ones in the end who take this recommendation made by the, by the committee, and they will say, okay, we will close it, or mm -hmm. no, you have to open it again and continue reviewing it. We had a, a lot of cases about, about that. <laughs> And um, one of the of the things that I mean, at least uh, myself and those studying international organizations, especially the UN system, is um, and you mentioned very briefly, um, um, is the bureaucracy. I mean, how bureaucratic the whole organization is. And this is connected to my following question. And this is, what are the the, the challenges that that you identify uh, that you encounter? while doing your job. I mean, you briefly explained now with, with the NGOs, but I mean, within the organization and also in relation to other stakeholders, what are the challenges that you identify as quite uh, relevant and how um, you tackle them in the process? Yes, uh, I would say that the first, yes, the first challenge that we have sometimes is that we have to stick to processes. Even if they don't make sense, we just have to stick because that's the way that we have been doing it. But it's even more frustrating when you are doing it and all of a sudden there is a change from the our executive offices, which are the, the highest offices where the USGs are working. And they can change the processes on the way back. So we cannot change them, but they can change it to us. And that's when things get a little bit complicated. Also, when our funding is uh, is deducted, that also is sometimes unfortunate because you are already thinking ahead of certain projects or, I don't know, uh, printing some booklets, something as easy as that, and then they tell you, mm -hmm. okay, the, the funds are freezed. And speaking of freezing, that also affects human resources. Right now, we are in, in the scarce of individual contractors because you cannot hire like a staff, fixed staff, but at the same time you cannot hire contractors for longer than two months. So it's a little bit the burden that you have to deal almost every day and to mm -hmm. negotiate here and there to see now with the pandemic again, because there was not a lot of travel. There were that was funding of the travel to be spent on something else, but they tell they told us exactly on what. So it's just a question to negotiate. Okay, we need the individual contractor, but also we need the software because we were attacking two years ago in, in our platforms. So it's, it's that part that, that we have to see what exactly is what we need, uh, the priorities in that moment. And then just to deal with what we, what we, what we, we have. And uh, thank you, Irma. Now I wanted to read uh, to you a question by, by Lewin. Um, He's an eBay researcher. Um, he asked, what pathways to entry in the UN system would you recommend besides internships? This is the case, for instance, for junior researchers who are already above the internship level. Uh, that's a very good question that I wish somebody told us that when we were recent graduates, uh, because sometimes you see the UN and you just go immediately to UN vacancies and see what they have. But definitely there are other areas. Um, one of them, it will be the, the UN agencies. When you see all these different levels and positions that they have, and I know because I get all these emails frequently about the um, 
national officers positions that might be temporary or might be fixed. Also, when you are European, you can apply through the juniors professional program, the JPOs, officers, sorry, and also consultancies. Consultancies are right now also very important to us because since we cannot get fixed positions, then you get in the individual contractors or consultants to do the job that other people cannot do it because we're short staff or definitely with certain skills. So for that, I would recommend, yes, to go to the UN, um, to the UN website called Inspira, and that's where you can see all these individual contractors positions that might be temporary. Well, they are temporary. You can work up to nine months and then you have to take a break because that's one of the rules. And then the office wants to bring you back, then they can, they can do it. But uh, again, try to apply through through agencies. I have a lot of friends who actually that's the way that they made it. They apply through their own countries and then they just start like escalating in the system and eventually moving into the secretariat. And now I, I wanted to ask you a follow up question also from Lewin. He asked, um, what's the one main skill or competence that you wish your studies had prepared you but they didn't. <laughs> Today, Bay, I have nothing to blame of. They did everything that they could, and I am very, very grateful of that. If I have, if there is something that I had to to do myself, it was to definitely improve my French. Maybe that was one of the biggest regrets that I have in my life that I diminish languages, thinking, oh, but French is only spoken in Canada and France. Turns out that that's not the reality. Most of the African countries speak French. And right now, if you want to go to to missions, that's one of the requirements uh, just to have French. So, And the same happens to other languages. Right now, our current Secretary General is Chinese, and there is a lot of preference for Chinese speakers. So I think languages are always important. And to mention another aspect, it will be to specialize on something. I think that's also very important. You can see some job openings that are very interesting, but this um, education officer, child protection officer, are very specific titles, but if you have the experience, then you can definitely move around later on. Great. And I, I wanted also to open the floor to um, to the attendees to this session if they wish to um, to speak by on the microphone if they want to raise their hands and ask any question to to Irma this is um, the moment to do so so in the meantime while the the attendees uh, think about about their questions I I was um, curious about this. Um, I mean, I mean, about this this issue about the consultants and I mean the short term contracts. I was wondering how easy or difficult it is to become uh, part of of the of the public service of the UN public service as an actual uh, public servant. I mean, becoming one, P two, P three, P four. Um, there are right now two ways to get into the into the yeah, into the professional category. For us, for us as um, general service, there is this way of G2N, and then there is the external way, which is the G2P. So basically, you apply to the test. If you if you pass the test, which is a written and oral section, then you just go into a roster list, which where you will be placed for three years, and then you just need to find a yeah to find a job in any of the station, not only in New York but in any other one. Once that you get through the through that process, then it's just a question to apply. There is the mobility mobility program, yeah. which means uh, after two years being in the at the P2 level, then there is a requirement for you to move around to start applying and and eventually move of the duty station. But also I know of a lot of cases that they apply just into different departments on the same duty station and they get selected. That that also happens. And and that sometimes is the most difficult part for professional people mm -hmm. because they might be sent to completely non-family duty stations with very hazard situations, and that's that's a job. So it's um, 
or, or the other way, I, I actually have some friends right now that they got a stock into the P2 level for many, many years, and now they just decided to apply on to temporary positions mm -hmm. uh, in Asia. Let's just uh, to put an example. And from there, now they are getting their fixed position with, with a promotion. So it's mm -hmm. that also, again, when you put everything in the balance, like, does it make sense to leave New York and now to be on, on a completely different situation, different language also? If you have family, well, then you speak to your family. So there's a lot of things to consider, but um, I would say if you are looking for promotion and eventually to, to grow in the, in the organization, it's always good to apply in order to these stations. I see. And, and now, Irma, I wanted to ask you about um, the role that you are currently doing at eBay. About, I mean, what is, I mean, could you tell us a bit more about this um, uh, visiting um, that you are currently doing at eBay? Sure. Um, last year, as a staff, um, there are some requirements that if, when you want to take a sabbatical leave, that's a, the, the name sabbatical leave program. So, which is basically to do a to do a research project that is linked to your current job, to your current um, responsibilities, in an academic institution, in a think tank, in an NGO. Because of that, I wanted to I wanted to get that experience. Now that I was that I was able to last year, I applied and I was selected among 30, 30 participants. So basically, I, because the eBay accepted me, we are working right now in how the NGOs, if this application that they submit to ECOSOC has an impact worldwide, once that they get the, the consultative status, is it worth it to do all the process? Are they getting uh, more impact on the ground? Are they getting more, more funding from the governments or, or even just more visibility? Or it might be not the case. So right now, that's the project that I am working on. And I have, I have the, the, the support of my supervisor, I also, well, the, of both of my supervisors. And then I have to present this document in, in the office, which also might raise questions, just a, it's like a, we call it as a pre-thesis of something mm -hmm. that I was working on for, for four months, because also there is a limit up to four months. So basically, I mean, you're, you're evaluating um, if, I mean, if actually uh, the membership within the council um, has returns for, 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 for their members, basically. Exactly, yes. Ah, well, looking forward to, to the results. <laughs> so um, more questions from the audience. I mean, you can write or you can speak on the phone, on the, uh, on the microphone. Otherwise, Irma, you, um, we also discussed the possibility that, I mean, if, if uh, eBay students wanted to reach out to you, they can write uh, to your email as well. Uh, is that correct? Correct, yes. Um, my, my email is just like my last name, Perez, E, e as uh, Elizabeth, at un.org. I will write it down here, at uh, un.org, right? Correct, yes. It's Perez you at UN.org, right? Perez A. Mm -hmm. Ah, Perez A. Okay, perfect. Yes. I will, I just share it uh, on the on the chat. So, questions, comments to your man? No? Okay, I see that, uh, yes, I see that this is, this is, uh, this is it. I would like Irma to thank you for sharing with, with us, I mean, your experience this in the, in the, in the afternoon. Um, and yes, I'm looking forward to, to reading the results from, from your uh, research and we wish you all the success in your career at the, at the UN. Thank you so much, Juan Carlos, and thank you everybody for taking the time to be to be with me today. It was a, really a pleasure to talk to you. Great, thank you. Bye bye. But thank you. Bye bye.